let's welcome, uh, sorry, Christian, <laughs> um, and uh, another Swift talk. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, and welcome to my talk um, on using or developing applications using OpenStack Swift as a storage backend. Uh, my name is Christian Schweder. Um, I'm a software engineer working at Red Hat, uh, also working on OpenStack Swift. Um, I just had a look before this talk. It's nearly five years ago that I started contributing to Swift, so for quite some time already. And yeah, I want to give you a short introduction on how to use Swift for application development. So before we start, um, or before I start talking about the REST API that actually um, is used to interact with OpenStack Swift, I want to give you a very short, brief summary about what is OpenStack Swift. Um, not as much as detailed as the earlier talks from today from Tiago and Alistair, but um, if you're interested in that one, videos should be available probably soon. Um, we are in room H2020-13, so uh, please have a look at these talks if you want to have a few more details about the, um, how Swift works internally. So, Swift itself, um, it's an object storage system. That actually means uh, I don't mount a file system, I don't mount a block device, um, I just have, well, basically an URL that actually um, gives or returns, for example, my object that I stored early on uses a very flat namespace. Um, I have a personal account within my Swift cluster, and this account contains containers, and containers are ju just a collection of uh, objects, actually. Um, and because of this um, flat namespace, it's mostly suited, actually, for unstructured data. So you would never, well, you should never actually try to do it, to do, for example, mounting and, and Swift object, even if it's possible, and, and store your database server files on it or whatever. Um, it's really more suited for, for example, videos, images, other large binary data sets. Um, and especially videos and images and other multimedia files, um, it's nice that you have actually an URL where you can access these objects because you can then just use it w within your browser. Swift itself is a very scalable system, very durable system. Um, the default, well, well, most people are actually using it with uh, three replicas, meaning that you have in the backend three copies of every object located on your storage uh, servers, and Swift is taking care of um, the replicate that each object is actually replicated, and even after years of time, um, there's, that there's, for example, no bit rot. Uh, it was too quick. One second. All right. Sorry for that. Um, it hasn't been. Had, it has been in production for well more than eight years now. Actually, it's one of the founding projects um, within OpenStack itself. Um, has been invented by or the original developers were um, at Rackspace. And um, that's the same amount of time that actually some Swift clusters are already running. And we have, or, well, there are known Swift clusters with more than like 75 petabytes of storage actually um, within a single cluster. So um, as an application developer, using an object storage is actually really nice because it really separates the application logic from the data pass logic. So when you create an application or write an application and you want to store some big data files, for example, video files, um, you don't need, really need to care about the data paths that you actually upload data um, through your application server, but um, you can upload the data to the Swift cluster and you only store metadata within your application, for example, using a database, or you're just um, storing references, for example, within Elasticsearch and um, let Swift itself handle the large data sets. When, you, when you're accessing a Swift cluster, you s you're using a simple REST API. Um, these are basically HTTP requests based on get, put, head, delete should be there too, um, and post requests. And as the end user or application developer, you're always talking to the Swift proxy, basically. And the proxy then in the background talks to your storage servers. And for example, in this case, makes sure that every object is replicated three times or well, it's sent three times to the storage nodes and uh, stored in a durable way. So 
when I talk about a Swift cluster in the following slides, I'm basically talking about um, interacting with a Swift proxy because that's actually the endpoint um, for the application. So a simple REST API request, um, actually even a, a simple GET request actually um, is, is a simple REST API request. So when you have an endpoint that looks some, something like this, and you have uh, these parts there, ours test, um, for example, that's your account name, and public in the first example would be your container name. And by doing so, you get actually a list of objects back. Um, at least if, that's, if this is a public readable container, um, that is. If this container is public readable, then you can also download um, the objects um, by just appending the object name at the end of the URL. And of course, you can also upload objects, but for uploading objects, you need actually uh, some kind of authorization. In this case, in the lower case, we have an uh, XAUS token that is sent along the request, and this token um, actually authenticates yourself to the Swift cluster, making sure that you're actually allowed to write data there. Um, there's a little bit more information in the reference link uh, down below. Um, before I continue with the remaining part, um, just a few um, information in general how to use Swift. When you send headers, um, there's a differentiation between, object, well, between customer metadata and system metadata. So, for example, I have, here, uh, I have uh, sent two, uh, two different headers along with a request. The first one is actually um, a system metadata, x delete after which uh, we'll come to in a few minutes again. And I have a custom metadata, and custom metadata always at the object level starts with x object meta, and then some key and a value. So you can store custom metadata alongside with your objects. Um, for example, that might be some reference to another object, or some information about the video file, some, some captions, some authors, titles, whatever. Um, there are different ways how to easily start interacting with a Swift cluster. Um, I think that probably one of the simplest one is to actually use the Python Swift client, um, this one. And there is a very useful option, uh, dash dash debug, which actually includes um, examples how to do the same request using curl. So when you do a list container, somewhere in the out uh, Swift debug list container, Somewhere in the output, you will see um, well, a very similar curl command, actually, um, that you can use directly and gives you some idea how to start interacting with the REST API directly and not using the Swift um, command line interface. There are two different ways how to send metadata with a Swift command line interface. The first one is in dash H or uppercase H, which actually natively just sends a header. And there's a lowercase dash m um, where you can just set some object data uh, directly um, using the Swift command line interface. All right. So that's that. Um, I just mentioned uh, earlier on that we need some authentication in, in many cases, or in most cases, actually, depending on your application, for uh, storing new data, um, sometimes for reading data back. And so let's talk a, lot, a little bit about this. When you start developing applications with Swift, um, you might actually want to run Swift only. Um, so you don't need the full OpenStack environment um, with Keystone, a database, and whatnot um, to actually start and testing Swift. And we have a built-in or included middleware called TempOS. Um, it's actually, we're actually using it both for development purposes as well as demoing and uh, showcasing stuff. So it's really meant to be uh, as a showcasing stuff uh, or testing stuff. Um, don't use it in production because the credentials that you're using here are actually stored in plain text in the proxy server configuration file. So um, it shouldn't be done in production, of course. However, um, using this one, it makes it or it, it shows um, very so easily how to use it. Actually, um, you're just sending two headers in this case: xaus user and xaus key. Um, which is, in this case, it's an uh, account name and a username in, within that tenant or account, and your key. And Swift returns a storage URL and um, authentication token. And you use this storage URL later on with the authentication token. And if you're the owner of that account, then you can upload 
uh, as much data as until your cluster is full. All right, so when you want to go into a production or a more production-like environment, then you, in many cases you're using Keystone, which is the OpenStack identity project. It goes very similar, um, but instead of sending headers, you're just sending a, a JSON blob, but you can see there's a password in it, there's a user in it, and um, you send it to, to a Keystone server itself. Keystone will return a token for you. Um, it will also return an URL for you, and you need to do a second query then uh, to get the actual endpoint for Swift because with Keystone you typically have like multiple endpoints for multiple services. For example, you run um, OpenStack Nova, OpenStack Swift, Cinder, Glance, whatnot, and each of these services has its own um, actual endpoint um, that you need to query from Keystone. All right, so you have a token and you have a header that you can, well, you have a token that you're sending as a header to some URL. This is nice. Um, if you do so using, for example, a command line interface or curl. But if you want to upload data, let's say, with your browser, your browser typically doesn't send, well, custom headers along with a request, right? Um, so we need somehow a way to send authenticated data, for example, using a browser. And there are two middlewares that um, work very similar to each other. Um, the first one that I want to introduce you to is tempurl. It actually uses pre-computed signed URLs, and um, these signed URLs are only valid for a very specific action and a short amount of time. So to use this, you need a key uh, that is later on used to sign this request, and you store this key as a metadata within Swift itself, either on the account name. In that case, it's um, valid for all the containers within that account, or on the container name, and um, the example in the first line there um, is a way how to set it. So when you have this key, you can um, actually compute these URLs. And it's, it's pretty easy. Um, you just need to define the method that you want to use, for example, for a GET request or a PUT request. Um, you need to define how long it should be used, and uh, then the full pass, for example, to the object um, that should be valid for this request. And then you do some HMAC stuff within Python, and uh, you get back some signature, and uh, you would append the signature to the full URL that you can see below. You might wonder actually why we're using SHA-1 checksums here. Um, and there are some good news. Uh, just of this week, we merged a patch um, that actually allows you to use SHA-256 and 512 checksums as well, so you don't need to use SHA-1 checksums anymore when you run the latest Swift versions. All right, so these are temporary URLs. We have a very similar working middleware called FormPost, and as the name a little bit implies, it's actually for HTML forms. So an HTML form might have some hidden input fields, and in this case, we make use of that. Um, this hidden in, well, one of the hidden input files actually um, gets a signature. And there are a few more fields that you can use here. Um, there's a field for redirecting the request. So when your browser finished the upload, Swift actually returns a redirect, and your browser will hopefully follow this redirect. You can also limit the maximum file size and the number of input fields for this HTML form, and only if all of these um, parameters are met. Um, and only, only in that uh, um, account, uh, this is a valid request. Oh, I, sh I should mention, mention something here. So um, when you do an upload using an HTML form, you somehow need the um, file name that the browser sent, actually. What you do is typically you upload to a container and then use a custom prefix, for example, a random UUID. And the browser will append the file name to the end of the URL that you just used um, for signing the request uh, as a pass name. So your application needs to take care a little bit of that. So after you uploaded the, the request, um, it's in many cases useful to have um, well some kind of action uh, at the redirect URL that actually updates, for example, some, some internal um, location for your Swift object in your application itself. 
I mentioned earlier on that uh, it's also possible to have public readable containers. Again, these are um, simply metadata settings um, on a container, for example. In this case, we're making a container public readable, um, which is uh, given by this uh, asterisk, uh, asterisk, and the error listings is um, responsible for actually enabling listings for public readable containers. When you have an account within OpenStack Keystone, for example, then you have a tenant, and within the tenant, different users. You can also differentiate um, between these users on a container base. So, for example, you could have a one container per user, um, and each user is only allowed to write into his own container uh, within that account. And if you want to um, have a look at the current ACLs that are set, you can, for example, use a Swift stat uh, command using the container name as a suffix, and then you get back the read and write ACLs. All right. Um, I should mention that some of these actions are only applied to the object level. Um, that's especially true for TempUL and form post requests. Both of them only apply to the object level, um, really to only well upload and download data. Um, anonymous requests are valid as long as you have a public readable container, and authentication tokens are, in most cases, um, because you're the owner of the account, um, valid on the account, container, and object level. And you should take this into account when you write applications um, that actually use Swift as a storage backend. Uh, let's assume you have um, some references within a database for Swift objects. Uh, and you give out an authentication token as an app to the application that is running on the client side, for example. Um, if the client actually has the authentication token, you might be able, or you might actually uh, modify Swift data inside Swift without updating your application um, itself, or the entries in your application. Um, so when you have references to Swift objects, in many cases it makes a lot of sense to only use TempUL or form post requests because the client can't do any harm to any other objects then. All right, um, let's have a look at a few API, API features. We have some modifiers for listings that both applies to, or mo most of them both apply to the container listing as well as the account listing. Um, I'm fo focusing here on the container listings. So when you simply apply a query string, for example, using the limit uh, equals two parameter, um, you can actually, well, limit the uh, amount of returned entries. So in this case, it would give you only the first two entries uh, two object names that are returned. Um, these features, or well, these modifiers are especially useful if you paginate um, over a container with a lot of objects. Let's assume you have a container with 100,000 objects in it. You probably don't want to show that to the user on a single page. You want to iterate over that uh, using multiple pages. And you do so by using markers, and markers, and limits. Um, by just like saying, okay, I'm starting here at entry number 1,000 and uh, continuing on the next page with entry number 2000, for example. I can also use um, some modifier to only list a specific subset of objects, for example, using this prefix. Uh, let's assume you store thumbnails and high-resolution pictures in the same container, but I only want to get the list of thumbnails within my request. Then I could use a prefix to actually filter these um, objects uh, for objects that are just starting with, in this case, sub, for example. And as a developer, I need some parsable data. Um, so um, what I can do is, uh, or what typically is done, the Swift itself will return the object listing just um, line, one entry per line. But you can also say, well, I need some JSON object um, or some XML object, and uh, you can do so too. Expiring objects is another useful feature um, that actually, so when you upload an object, uh, you can specify a time after um, the object becomes unavailable. And that might be either seconds from now or a Unix epoch timestamp. And what, what goes on in the background inside Swift, Swift will immediately stop um, returning the object after the time expired. And a little bit delayed, there's a process running in the background. It really deletes the Swift object um, there on the cluster. <laughs> 
What we didn't mention so far today, I think, um, is that we actually limit Swift objects in size. And by default, these are five gigabytes. So there's a reason for that. Uh, let's assume you have a very large high resolution uh, video. And uh, sometimes users are doing that with terabytes of, for a single file. Um, when you look at the underlying level, you have, you have of course, a couple of disks. And by actually limiting and splitting objects into multiple segments or chunks, you spread the load and spread the data across multiple disks. That's one of the reasons why we're splitting these objects, or you have to split them, actually, and we limit that. But um, we have a concept of, um, well, static large objects, and we have also dynamic large objects, but um, I'm focusing on static large objects here. Um, we're using a manifest later on, and this manifest actually defines where are my chunks located. There is, <coughs> sorry, there is another um, popular um, public object storage, which actually uses a little bit different uh, concept. Uh, when you upload chunks there, uh, you need to uh, send a manifest later on too, but in that case, it combines uh, all these chunks into a single object. That is not done on Swift. Uh, Swift really keeps the chunks, uh, and you can later on reuse this concept. For example, if only a few chunks within your file changed, Let's assume you have a large video file, and you cut your video file, for example, or update some metadata within, the, within your video file. You don't need to upload the whole object again, which might be terabytes of data. You only upload the chunks that really change later on. Range requests, again, uh, video is one of my favorite uh, topics within this talk. Um, sounds simple, but especially uh, you want this for videos. Um, it's just basic or general HTML, uh, HTTP stuff um, where you define the, the range where you want to start and end and uh, use that as a, in your requests. The nice thing with videos is most, or, well, all browsers that I know of um, or that I use, uh, which is Chrome, Firefox, Safari, um, supports this out of the box. So when you have a very, um, very simple HTML file, you have in HTML5 this video um, entry. And you define, for example, a Swift object, um, Big Bug Bunny in this case. And when you do so, your browser actually generates a preview for you. If you look at the second line there, um, it's a GET request. And actually, the, the original video file is more than 600 megabytes in size but your browser will only uh, retrieve the first few megabytes and create a, um, some, or a preview for you. And the same is true when you do a seek in the video using your browser. <clears throat> it won't um, load all the data, it just jumps in the file and this is supported out of the box by Swift which is, makes it really easy usable for uh, video and other kind of data. Um, versioning is another tool, or is another very helpful um, feature of Swift. You can actually, when you uh, have a container, you can specify a location, uh, another container actually, um, to use. So whenever you overwrite data, for example, in an existing object, the older version will be still stored in your archive container. Same is true for delete requests. If you send a delete request to a container where versioning is actually enabled, it will, it will store the last version of your object as well in the archive container and an additional delete marker. So one of these two objects here that have both timestamps um, is actually an empty object, a zero byte sized object, and it has a content type of a delete, co uh, delete, delete object. <clears throat> when you're writing applications that are running in the browser, for example using Angular, JS, and you're serving the Angular side from a different domain than your Swift cluster runs, then you need to enable a feature called course, which is a cross-origin resource sharing. So let's assume Swift runs on one domain or subdomain. Uh, your static web file or your static file with Angular stuff runs on a different one. By default, um, it's not possible for this application running in your browser to retrieve or to use the data that is used, for example, from a container listing. Um, and to enable this one, you again set a special uh, metadata flag on a container, 
that actually makes this possible. All right. A little, little bit rough voice. Let's have a look at a few examples. So <clears throat> I mentioned Angular early on. Um, what we're doing here, or what we're having here, is a base URL, which in this case is a public readable container. And um, I use, in this case, a prefix uh, called image and doing an HTTP request, which actually retrieves a list of objects in that um, container. And once this request has been done, um, I store the list of images uh, somewhere in my application and call a function called show image. And this show image function actually does an additional head request because I want to retrieve some metadata for this image in this case. Um, you can have a look at the full example in the given URL below later on. Uh, I'll share that with you. Um, but actually, it's, it's a very similar, simple um, Angular application that browses or is a basic um, image gallery um, built on top of Swift. So what actually is done here is it shows an image that is stored in Swift. And the head request that I just mentioned is um, happening in the background. So there is a metadata field called X object meta caption. And the caption value in this case is then shown below the image in this case, for example. Uh, very simple, but um, quite powerful if you want to use or build on top of that. So how do you get the data into Swift? Well, turns out um, I, have, well, I use a software called Adobe Lightroom, which is unfortunately not open source, but um, it's easily extendable. Uh, you can write your own plugins for this. Um, it's not written in Python or something similar. It's written in Lua. But the concept of temp URLs makes it really easy to include that um, within this application as well or other applications. So I just need to compute or pre-compute this signed URL and reuse that. And what I've done or running at home is um, a small plugin that is also available on my GitHub account where you just use a storage URL with a temporary key and you can directly export from Lightroom your pictures to um, OpenStack Swift. If you want to use Python, uh, the probably the simplest way is to actually use a Python Swift client itself, which is um, the Swift command line interface itself, but it's also included, or, well, it also includes um, reusable uh, parts or libraries um, within your application. And again, what you're doing there is you get an authentication token in the storage URL using your username, password, and from that on you have actions like get account, put container, um, put object, uh, list containers, stuff like that, and it's really easy to use. Um, within your application. When your application wants to give out temporary URLs, you need this temporary meta key, and it's a good approach to actually first try to check if there's a key already existing on the container or account, and if not, um, create one randomly, or create a randomly one, and set that on, a, on the account, for example. And if you want to have a um, closer look at how to do this with, uh, with Python. Um, there's an application called Django Swift Browser. As the name implies, um, it's written in Django and Python. And that actually uses all these concepts like uh, temp URLs, form posts for uploading data directly to Swift, um, the listings with prefixes, public URLs, whatnot. And it's a really easy build, or I think at least, it's a really easy uh, to, to read uh, Python code. So please have a look um, at that one. All right, <clears throat> so how do I get started? There are different ways. And um, for years, we used the concept of called Swift all-in-one um, installations that we are still using as, de as Swift developers. Um, but it's a little bit overkill, probably, if you just want to start out, because it's a very long document. You need to do a lot of stuff. Um, Based on that, we have some uh, vagrant environments that you can also use, but you can make your life a little bit simpler if you just want to try out some things, for example, using the API. Um, Docker Swift is, a, is something that we or worked on like half a year, a year ago, just as like a POC stuff, but it turned out it runs pretty well for uh, like showcasing stuff. 
Um, it's a very simple environment where you run everything in a single um, Docker container, and you can just start um, interacting with the with the REST API. And with the REST API itself, um, I would uh, encourage you to use Python Swift client. And if you use these credentials on the slide um, together with this Docker Swift environment, um, then you can easily start using and playing with Swift and the Swift API. All right, so that's it. It was a little bit faster than I thought, but uh, we have more time for questions, which is also great. So, any questions? Everything unclear? Everything clear? Yeah. So you showed that uh, files greater than five gig have to get split to chunks. Yes. Uh, but then you also said that browsers are going to make requests in the greater quantities. Yes. But how does that, does it, when the backend has to then retrieve a range of like the, the 57th gig, it now needs to know a different object ID because it's not sharing the same object ID? No. Uh, so actually, what, so, so the question is, um, what happens when you split up, for example, your 50 gigabyte video file and you want to do range requests if you need a different object ID? Um, no, you don't need so. So let's assume um, you name your chunks like this one, like chunk and then a, a number, an increasing number. So you have all these chunk objects there. And finally, you're uploading an, um, a manifest object uh, using this, well, object name there. If you just use this object name, Swift itself and the Swift proxy uh, server itself will take care of accessing the other uh, chunks of that, of that file. So if you just stream it um, from the proxy server, the proxy server will make sure that you just need the single URL and everything is taken care of for you. So you don't need to play with this. Yeah. There are two. Uh, once we go first, you first. Yes. And we need to put it in a cache. Yes. Yes. Uh, how uh, is there any best pra practice to move logic of uh, temp URL? You have to give access to this file uh, by knowing the signature and, and so on. But how to put this logic of temp URL in cache? Because cache is cache stands uh, first. Okay, so the question is if you have a temporary signed URL and you have a cache in front of the Swift proxy server, um, is there a be best practice to do to use this? Well, the Swift proxy itself will send headers along with a response to not cache this object itself. Um, your question is more like, okay, what? how do I ensure that this object, which might be accessed very frequently and after some time runs um, into the expiration time, probably, that it's still accessible? Well, that's a good question. Um, there are different ways to do so. So um, if this object is always, should be always public readable, then I would just put it in a public readable container. If not... Um, Sorry? It's not our choice uh, uh, to make this uh, public or temporary URL. Client wants to give access to his files. Yes. Uh, restricted. But those files at the same time are very popular in his uh, application. I don't know why. Okay. Okay, so um, to repeat this part, the client gives out a special URL or wants to give out a special URL for a uh, private object that might be accessed very frequently. Well, in that case, I wouldn't give out the actually temporary URL to share with, but uh, an URL pointing to your um, application, and your application then <laughs> creates temporary URLs um, per request, or for example, for 60 seconds. Um, and the reason for this is, if you, for example, give out an application or a temporary URL that is valid, let's say, for a month, and your client decides later on, well, that wasn't a good idea that I actually shared this temporary URL. You can't revoke it. Well, you could invalidate and, and override your 
your metadata setting temp URL key, of course, to revoke this. Um, but it might be actually much easier um, to handle this in an application that then simply returns um, a redirect to the actually signed temp URL request. Make sense? Or? So actually, what you had in mind um, is part of, of the Swift browser. Um, I'm using very similar approach here. I'm generating like a random uh, UID and it is stored inside the Swift browser. And then um, if this is accessed, it creates a temporary URL for you and redirects the browser directly. So from a browser point of view, I'm just accessing this URL and the browser follows the redirect and downloads the object in that case. But that would really require a little bit of logic at least uh, on, on your client application. Yeah. More questions? All right. Then, oh. Just one short notice. Um, the slides are available at the FOSTEM website on the talk details. So if you want to have a look at the links, um, please feel free to do so. Thank you.